You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. Today, the inimitable M.D. Vickers returns with a brand new tale of the macabre. In A Terribly Strange Pumpkin, two gents entering a vegetable growing competition get a little ahead of themselves with ghastly results. We hope you enjoy it, folks. A Terribly Strange Pumpkin by M. D. Vickers You entering the vegetable growing competition this year, Bert? John Eckersley asked. Bert Cranston looked up at the overcast sky and swung up an arm to scratch his head. He hesitated, conscious of the clump of psoriasis there, then diverted his fingers as close to the itch as he could. Not sure, maybe. Motivation a bit low at the moment, the old black dog, etc. He continued to look up at the dismal canvas of sky, his whole demeanour appearing completely deflated. They were both on their adjoining allotments. Bert was a retired chemistry teacher, John a former postal worker, now also retired. Eckersley returned, "'Think I am, something to aim for. Maybe marrows. They always go down well. And you can get some big uns. Cranston brought his gaze to bear on Eckersley, seeming to ruminate. "'Pumpkins. They're your best bet.' "'Hmm, pumpkins. Yeah, I bet you could get some corkers there. You'd opt for those if you went for it?' Cranston was once more staring not so much at the sky, but through it. "'Maybe. Who knows? Back burner for now. How long till it starts?' "'October the 31st. We've got a couple of weeks. Starting late compared to some if we do it. Halloween, so your pumpkin would be particularly apt. Probably be a few submitted to be fair. Bit of a challenge there already for you, Bert. Make yours the best. Cranston swung his bleary eyes back to Eckersley once more. Hmm, yeah, good point. Good point. Fancy gathering up the tools and packing away for the day. Back to mine for a tincture. John considered. Aye, why not? Just the one. Alcohol gives me the bile these days. They started putting tools back into the shed, then left the allotment as the sky got darker, and they both grew a little older. Cranston's abode wasn't too far from the allotments. The gutter was a jungle. Blackberry bushes grew rampantly in the front garden. Bert let them both in. The front door swung open with a creak. A waft of tobacco hit Eckersley full in the face. He didn't mind it, though. Still loved the odour, even after thirty years since quitting. Cranston sorted out some tumblers and filled them with whisky in the front room. Eckersley collapsed into a sagging armchair and gladly received it. Cranston sat in a chair opposite and chugged his all in one. He had a problem with it, John knew, but he'd given up trying to save him. He was too long in the tooth. Bert took out his fags and slid one out the pack. He also got himself a whisky refill, almost to the top of the tumbler. As far as Eckersley was aware, Cranston had never married, although he didn't know that much about him, really. Just odd bits of information. He didn't delve, wasn't that interested, if he was honest. Just a chap like himself, in his twilight years, who he'd met on the allotment about a year ago. So, this competition. Bert was already slurring a little, probably hardly eaten all day apart from a little porridge. Not that I think you'd beat me or anything like that, but how would you feel about pairing up? Can you do that? Eckersley considered, twirling his scotch round in his glass. Yeah, I think you can. Why, you got a plan? He grinned and gave Bert the stare. Cranston grinned back. Maybe I have. Maybe I have. Of course, you know I used to be a chemistry teacher. Could come in handy, could that? Eckersley manoeuvred himself to the edge of the chair. You mean a dash of 
Genetic engineering birds? I'm truly shocked. Won't they test them for stuff like that? Cranston belched and dragged on his cigarette, took it real deep down, before blowing it out through his nose in twin streams. Nah, doubtful. Never heard of them doing that. The two trust him, methinks. If you're in, what I want you to do tomorrow is buy a decent-sized pumpkin. A good one. Good size. We can do the rest. We're not even going to grow it? Eckersley inquired. <laughs> this is insane. Count me in, though. A grand prize money, innit? Half each? Sixty-forty, returned Cranston. Seeing as I'll be doing most of the work. He grinned again, drunkenly. Mm, might take me chances with a marrow, Eckersley countered. Full amount. I could grow a crumper, I reckon. Cranston stared at him, all serious now. It's up to you. But trust me, you'd never beat this pumpkin. <laughs> no one would. He swallowed his whiskey all in one and went for another top-up, grabbing Eckersley's glass also. Bert sounded so adamant about this that John felt himself being pulled in. Four hundred quid, not bad for doing virtually nothing. He held his returned glass up to Bert's to initiate a toast. Go on then, you're on. I'll hunt one out tomorrow. That's the spirit, Cranston replied, and they clinked glasses, whiskey slopping all over the ghastly carpet. It was game on. The following day, Eckersley drove ten miles to get a pumpkin, less risk of being seen by someone he knew. He selected a good one from a local fruit and veg shop. Hefty. He paid in cash, then called off for a coffee while reading a paper. After an hour, he stood up and his knees fired twin rifle reports. The weather was overcast, matching his mood somewhat. He mused over death a lot lately. Years he could never get back. The inexorable journey towards the abyss. His wife, Joan, had died of cancer five years ago. Pancreatic. Five months after diagnosis, she was scattered over Bluebell Park, a mile from their house. He clambered behind the wheel, placing the pumpkin on the passenger seat. He had a bad feeling about this, and he didn't know why. He hoped he was wrong. He arrived at the allotment mid-afternoon, the pumpkin in a hessian sack he'd procured from his shed at home. He walked over to Cranston's shed on his allotment and tapped on the door. Come in, Cranston barked, and Eckersley lumbered in somewhat awkwardly with his acquisition. He lifted the pumpkin out and donked it as gently as he could on the cluttered table in there. You got a beaut there, John. Cranston exclaimed. This is going to work perfectly. I've got the concoction I need right here. He rubbed his hands and took a swallow from his hip flask. The concoction was a purple liquid in a glass vase. He had a syringe nearby. Is that it? Eckersley inquired. Is that all there is to it? Cranston looked up. Aye, this is all we need. Whipped it up last night after you'd gone. It'll work wonders. Won't the others on the allotment be a bit curious that we're not out there growing things as normal? Eckersley queried. Cranston harumphed. People don't care what other people are doing, not really. At your age, you should know that by now. He took another swig. Okie doke, I guess so. Let's get this show on the road. When's its first jab, Bert? Right about No. Cranston reached for the syringe and plunged it into the vase, sucking up some of the peculiar liquid. He stuck the needle into the pumpkin and injected it all in at once. Once a day should bring us up to the date of the showing. I reckon we could get this bugger to almost fill this shed. Eckersley goggled. What? No way. They'd know something was up. Cranston gave him a wink. That's the gamble he uttered with a throaty chuckle, and finished the remainder of his flask. Over the next few days, the pumpkin grew. It was noticeable pretty much the day after. The orangey colour had dulled somewhat, but it was definitely gaining bulk by degrees. 
John had no idea what Bert was injecting into the thing. All he knew was, it was working, quite magnificently. He popped in frequently. He was fascinated by the metamorphosis. One night, he and Bert were sat in the shed, drinks in hand, cigarette smoke billowing all around. There was a light tap on the door. Bert leaped up, and his chair flew backwards. He lunged for the door, opening it only fractionally. It was Arthur Melling, who had an allotment nearby. Hi, Bert. Just wondering if you're entering the competition this year. I've got a belting marrow on the go. Could be a winner. Bert remained, well, as cool as a cucumber, you could say. Maybe, Art. You'll have to wait and see. Who knows? Not much evidence of anything, Melling returned, looking over his shoulder. Still, no doubt you've got some surprises up your sleeve. I'm off anyway. Good night, Bert. Catch you tomorrow, maybe. If only you knew, Cranston thought, and waved him goodbye before quickly closing the door. Close one, Eckersley voiced. Nah, he's thick as a plank. Let him concentrate on his marrow. Cranston sat back down after picking up his chair, and they talked about old times as the pumpkin grew a little bigger hour by hour. Five days later, the pumpkin resembled a colossal orange boulder on the table, almost touching the roof of the shed. Bert asked for John's help as they both lifted it onto the floor. It was monstrously heavy. It landed with a dull thud and rolled briefly before hitting the side of the shed. The table was pushed to one side to allow it as much room as possible. Bert had measured the circumference at around fourteen feet. He was very pleased with its progress. So pleased, he was celebrating by doubling his usual alcohol intake. It was amazing to see the progress, also unnerving and uncanny. Sinister. A week to go before the show. This thing was going to be ludicrously vast, if it carried on at the same rate. John doubted Arthur Melling's marrow would be much competition at all. Three days before the showing, Bert announced he was going to carve a face in it, to add effect. It was now nearly eighteen feet all the way round, and about five feet high. They were running out of room in the shed. Bert agreed that after one more injection, it was probably time to stop, or it was going to burst right through the wood. John didn't envy the carving. Hell of a job. It would be a good finishing touch, though. He left him to it for the day and did a bit of shopping before going for a good long walk to try and banish the uneasiness he was feeling. Hopefully unfounded, but he couldn't shake it. Returning from an eight-mile round trek, though, he felt a little better. He had a microwave lasagna for dinner, then set off for the allotment, as the light was just beginning to drain out of the day. He arrived there ten minutes later. He was tired from the walk, but intrigued to see that vast monstrosity with a face carved in it. It suddenly hit him. How on earth were they supposed to get it out of the shed? He hadn't given it a thought, and Bert had been too loaded most of the time, that he probably hadn't considered it either. They'd no doubt find a way when the time came, even if it meant having to widen the doorway, which would more than likely be the case. He ambled towards the shed, and gently pushed the door open. No light on, which was odd. Bert must have gone home, though he knew John was coming round later. He strode in, and flicked on the lighting. Nope, Bert must have gone home after all. Why was the shed door unlocked, though? He wouldn't risk that. Maybe he was tanked up and had gone to the local off-license for another bottle. John looked at the pumpkin, now taking up the bulk of the shed. He could see Bert had carved out the eyes and the nose, but hadn't got round to the mouth. Seemed more and more like he'd been distracted and left for some reason. John turned off the light and left the shed. He agonized over the unlocked door. He could fasten the lock— but what if the key was in the shed? He was tired, couldn't be bothered searching for it, so he took the risk and left it. It was pretty dark now, anyway. 
He headed over to Bert's place. It didn't take long. He knocked on the flaky door and waited. No one answered. No lights on. He tried the door. Locked. There was an equally flaky bench under the front window. He sat down and waited. Bert had a mobile phone, but never used it. Some Nokia, probably in a drawer. He didn't have the number, so he couldn't at least try it. He tried his landline. It just rang and rang. An hour had gone by. John was getting worried now. What if he dropped dead somewhere? He had to search for him. The local off-license was now closed. He traversed the streets, hardly anyone about. Panic was creeping in. Where the hell was he? He went back to his house and knocked and rang again. Still no answer to either. He went round to the back of his house. There was a kitchen window left partially open. He pushed it all the way up, dragged a terracotta pot towards it, and leapt up and dragged himself in. Luckily, it was a pretty big window. He walked through the whole house shouting his name. He wasn't here. His heart beating hard now. He decided to go back to the allotment. He couldn't think of anything else. Back through the window he went. Over to the allotment he ran, even though he was exhausted now. He carefully made his way over to the shed with the light from his phone. Unlike Bert, he was into his tech. He entered the shed once more and turned on the light. He stared at the pumpkin again. The floor was strewn with carved-out mulch. Bert hadn't bothered cutting off the top, though, to scoop it out. He couldn't blame him. That would have needed heavy digging with a spade. He wasn't planning on turning it into some huge jack-o'-lantern. He just wanted the face. He squatted down and shone his phone torch over the vast orange bulk. Two large triangular eyes and a nose the same. Why had he abandoned it like this? He shone the light further down and realized he'd been wrong initially. There was a mouth of a sort, but it wasn't the usual gaping, jagged orifice. He could see a long, thin gap. Also, there were large cracks spanning from the corners of the mouth. He remained squatted and was suddenly filled with a terrible, glassy fright. Maybe, maybe, but had carved the mouth open, and, and it. He shone his light into the eyes and nose of the pumpkin. He couldn't see anything, apart from the fleshy insides of a pumpkin. John felt a terror like he'd never felt in his life. He stepped back, his eyes never leaving the monstrosity before him. He was being stupid, imagination carrying him away to a very bad place. He backed towards the door his lasagna, a ball of gloop in his shriveled-up stomach. As he stepped outside, the lasagna decided it wanted out, and he leaned over and threw up all over the grass. After a time, he gathered himself together, and this time he locked the shed without any hesitation whatsoever. The day of the competition came round. It was a good day for it. Arthur Melling won with his marrow, which John had to admit was quite impressive. John Eckersley had checked absolutely everywhere for Bert Cranston. No hospital admittances, no sightings from others on the allotment, neighbours, nothing. He had no family, as far as he knew. The man had literally vanished into thin air. Six months later, John Eckersley returned to the allotment. He was hoisting the lamp hammer, he used it on the lock on Bert's shed door, which shattered almost instantly. With an accelerating heart, he stepped inside, assailed by a putrid smell of rotting vegetation. He glanced over where the pumpkin used to be. It was there, but now it was just a rotting mess, rivulets of slime trickling across the floor of the shed. He stepped over the worst of the slurry, using his phone torch once again. It appeared to flash off something within the morass of decay. He leaned closer. He reached out, tentative to touch the horrific remnants, but 
intrigued to find out the source of the flash. His fingers closed around the metallic object, and he brought it closer to his face, filled with dawning realization and an awestruck horror even beyond anything he'd ever felt previously. In his trembling hand was Bert Cranston's hip flask. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.